Well, good morning, Walden Church. We are in a new sermon series called Come and See. It comes from the very beginning of John's Gospel, John chapter 1. Uh, in the first story, there's a story about John the Baptist, and uh, he's got two of his disciples standing with him. He sees Jesus walking by, and he says, Behold the Lamb of God. Two of his disciples then leave. They begin to follow Jesus, and Jesus says, uh, What are you looking for? And the two disciples say, Rabbi, where are you staying? And Jesus says, come and see. In the second story, in that same chapter, Jesus is calling his disciples. And as he's calling him, Philip runs to Nathanael, finds him, and says, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, come and see. So we're heading into Easter right now. We are taking 10 weeks and we are going to discover who Jesus is, the authentic Jesus. And we're going to ask all kinds of questions. And I hope that through these 10 lessons, it'll be us taking each other's hand and saying, come and see, come and see Jesus. And I know, I know. What, what could possibly be exciting or new or different or interesting about a study in Jesus, we've probably turned every stone, we've asked every question. I just didn't want Easter to sneak up on us this year. We always prep and plan for Christmas. We over plan for Christmas, right? We decorate, we have uh, the nativity out, we do the advent candles, we get ready, we've got a Christmas Eve service, but then Easter, Easter only gets one service. It, it lands like a ton of bricks and then it vanishes. So I said, you know what? Let's make a big deal out of Easter this year. So in John chapter 1, we see disciples, they're hungry to learn, they're curious to know if this Jesus really is the Messiah, and we see this phrase repeated, come and see, come and check it out for yourself. So I pray that through this series, through Easter this year, you are taken to a loving and holy Jesus. Last week, we looked at Jesus's interaction with the woman at the well, and we looked at how Jesus is trying to get us to take hold of that abundant life. Today we're going to read from Mark chapter 5, and we got several stories. I'll begin right at the top. It says, they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes, and when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He had lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him any more, not even with a chain. For he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus? Son of the Most High God. What a weird question to ask God, right? Some Bible translations say, what do you want from me? Others say, why are you interfering with me? Because right now, there's a whole herd, or I don't know, a pack, a pack of demons, and they are the ones talking, and we would assume that Jesus is against them. Right? He's not on their side. So to see Jesus is to know that the, the person coming for, toward you is against you. Yes? I don't know. Maybe some reasons why people don't go to church, or maybe they don't read their Bible, or they don't pray, is because they assume, I've been away for so long. I've been wandering in the desert for so long, and being disobedient for so long, and perhaps to see God, to be in his presence again, would know that he is probably against me. Even the demons are afraid of God's wrath, and they shout out, why are you interfering with us? I adjure you by God, do not torment me, he said. For he was saying to them, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? He replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. And now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him, saying, Send us to the pigs, let us enter them. So he gave them permission, 
and the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs, and the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. The herdsmen fled and told it to the city and in the country, and people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus, and they saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had had the legion, sitting there clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. So the demons ask to be driven from Jesus' presence. But then when the people arrive, they don't congratulate Jesus or pat him on the back or say good job. They also ask Jesus to leave. They don't want to be in his presence. What? Why? Well, the Bible says that they were afraid. The demons were afraid of Jesus. They were his enemy, and rightly so. But the townsfolk, they were afraid too. It's a very different reaction than we saw from the Samaritan people coming to see Jesus that we read about last week. We have a local demon-possessed man who has obviously been a problem in the past, so much so that the people of the city have tried to tie him to a rock out in the wilderness so that he wouldn't come back into town. He always breaks free, which means someone was probably in charge of walking out there every now and then to make sure he was okay or make sure that he had food to eat. And Jesus cures him. And then they say, thanks, Jesus. Uh, can you leave? In fact, where else in all of the Bible do we ever see Jesus heal someone? And then, instead of thanking him, the people drive him away. Why would they do this? Perhaps they feel like they don't need him. Look at another healing story. John 9 says, As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And the disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? So, a little insight. It was a common belief that if something was wrong with you, that meant something was wrong between you and God. Ailments, sickness, disease, poverty, those are punishments from God. Do we do this today? Sure, right? We stub our toe. What's the first thing we say? Ah, why me? Why me, God? We, we blow a tire on the road. Why me, God? Something bad happens to us, so obviously there's a reason. Whenever something bad happens, or even something we don't agree with, or maybe we can't even believe it, we immediately jump to, well, there must be a reason. Human beings are meaning makers. Something happens and we say, well, I'll get to the bottom of this. So if this man is blind, then obviously something is wrong. Jump back to our man wandering around the tombs. A demon-possessed man. If he's sick, he's impaired, then obviously he is a sinner. And if he is a sinner, he's getting what he deserved. Let me ask you a question. Do you think anybody back in town was praying for him? Maybe his mother, his family? What about his rabbi? What about his synagogue? I mean, we'd like to think so. We want to believe that there's someone back in town that cares about him. Someone back in town who's praying for him. But here he is, constantly being tied up to rocks on the outskirts of town, it's probably a good assumption that the answer is no. Jesus comes along, and perhaps this is the first person to show him kindness in a long time. Why would anyone pray for him? He's getting from God what he deserves. Mark 5, verse 21. And then Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, and a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, 
my little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made alive and live. And he went with him. So first part of the chapter, nobody wanted Jesus to heal the demon possessed man. And now next, next story, a synagogue leader begs Jesus, heal my little girl. Jump down to verse 35. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. So picture this, you're trying to reach Jesus in time. Your daughter is at death's door. Hurry, Jesus, I need you. Again, very different than the first story. And then pushing through the crowd, one of your servants, <gasps> he's out of breath to tell you, it's too late. She's already dead. Jesus sees the despair in the man's face and he says, wait, don't give up hope. It's not too late. Because hearing that your daughter is dead would cause you to lose hope, to give up. And the servant bringing the message is even a little cruel, isn't he? And he says, you know, why trouble the teacher any further? Hey, hey, stop bugging God, right? God doesn't want to hear your problems. Did you ever have a boss or a supervisor at work whose door was always closed? If you wanted anything or you had a question, you had to go and knock and then be allowed in, given permission to come in. Did you ever have a parent that you were too afraid to ask anything of? Maybe you wanted a second helping of food or you needed new pants or new school supplies and you were too afraid to trouble them because you knew they're too busy for me. Don't trouble the rabbi with your problems. If I were to take your hand right now and I was gonna tell you, come and see Jesus, who would I be taking you to see? A man who went out of his way to help, even when he's not asked, or a man who's too busy to help. What do you think? When you pray to God and you ask God for things, right? You're praying, you take your troubles to God, you ask God, how do you picture God? It, 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 do you see a God who wants to help you? Or do you see a God who's too busy? I, I can't ask God for, for that. that that's, that's too little, that's so small. You know, God has, God has to deal with other problems, with other people. I, I don't wanna trouble him with my problems. Or in the case of Jarius, I can't ask God to do that. It's too late. I missed my chance. I missed my opportunity. God can't do anything now. The expiration date is passed. I mean, God doesn't raise the dead. Verse 37. And Jesus allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him, but he put them all outside. All right, all right, all right. You guys, you all, you all, you don't believe, get out. Right? Jesus surrounds himself with only the people who have hope, only the people who believe. Five people. And they laughed at him, but he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in to where the girl was. And taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking for she was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. What an amazing story of healing. So much different than the story of the demon-possessed man. But we skipped one, didn't we? 
We skipped a story. In between the story of Jairus' daughter, there's another healing. Jairus asked for Jesus to hurry, right? Come, quickly, my daughter is dying. And then another person cuts in line. If you go back up to verse 24, it says, A great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years, and who had suffered much under many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus, and came up behind him in the crowd, and touched his garment. For she said, If I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. She is an unclean person. She is not allowed to be in public. She is covered up, hoping that nobody else knows that she's there. Because if she touches someone, they become unclean. If she touches their clothing, their clothing becomes unclean. She is contaminated. She has cooties. She is supposed to be in lockdown. She is supposed to be in isolation. If she were caught out in public, she would be ridiculed. But she believes. Every story she had heard about him, she believes. She believed Jesus' heart. She believed Jesus' character. And she knew that God would heal her. God has promises in Scripture, and she believed them. But if she were sick, right, then obviously she's a sinner. And she's getting what she deserves. God is too busy. Don't bring your troubles to God. You know what is unique about this woman? When everybody else around her believes that, she doesn't. She has hope. In fact, she believes something different. Malachi 4.2 says, But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. Now, in the Hebrew language, words can have multiple meanings, just like in English. The ancient Hebrew language has very few words, though. Compared to English, there's very few words in Hebrew. And so the word wings in Hebrew is the word kanah. It says, there will be healing in his kanah. So this passage can also be read healing in his edge or his edges. So the word for wings, right? Because these would be, these would be the, your edges. These are the edges of your body, right? It's the same word for corners. So if you think about what on Jesus' person has edges and corners, well, it would be his prayer shawl. As a rabbi, he's wearing a prayer shawl. And from the prayer shawl hang phylacteries, little strips of uh, thread. So legend began to surround this passage, that the Messiah would have some sort of healing power in his prayer shawl. And the woman believes the legend. And she says, even if I touch the hem of his garment, I will be made well. And Jesus, perceiving in himself the power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And the disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and you say, Who touched me? And he looked to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Jesus says, ha, ah, who, who touched me, right? Who touched my prayer shawl? There's no way Jesus could have felt that, right? With everybody else touching him, and he calls out, hey, 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 wait, stop. Who touched me? Who did this? Because the woman had snuck up on him, and this would probably be a good time to sneak away, right? But she doesn't. She owns up. She steps forward. She removes her hood. And she says, I did it. 
And then she tells him everything. It says, but the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. Why does Jesus stop? Why does Jesus have her come forward? Because God can't be bothered. Because God's healing and God's grace are only for those who ask. They're only for perfect people. Does Jesus have her come forward publicly to shame her? No. Because he has a message for her. That's why. He says, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. You see, Jesus wanted her to know two things. First was that there was no magic about his clothing. He didn't want her to think that his clothing had power. He didn't want her to leave that encounter with, with the mindset that it was his clothing that had healed her. He says, your faith healed you. His first message to her was, it was your faith that healed you. Jairus runs up to Jesus with faith too. But then he hears his daughter is dead. And Jesus cautions him, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Hold on to that faith, Jesus says. Hold on to that hope, don't give up. Jesus tells everyone that didn't have faith to leave the room. He doesn't even want them around. So Jesus makes an ec extra effort here with this woman. And he says, it was your faith that healed you. And then the second message Jesus has for her is the very first word, daughter. He calls her daughter. Why does Jesus want her to know that? Because he doesn't want her to live in fear. He doesn't want her to be in shame. He doesn't want her to hide. You don't have to worry about taking your requests to God. Why? Because you are God's child. John 10.10 10 says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Look, as a parent, don't you want to give everything to your child? You'd give them the stars and the sky if you could. They should never worry about coming to you for anything. They should never worry about asking for things they need. Their presence is not a bother to you. And your heavenly father is no different. Did you ever notice that when Jairus runs up first in line and he says, my daughter is sick and he's patiently waiting for Jesus to come, he's a synagogue leader. He is someone important in the city. He's an official. He is a person who sits at the head of the table and his request is interrupted by an unnamed woman who, just like the demon-possessed man, is an outcast and someone who lives alone. Perhaps very few people know her or have her in their life. She is a nobody. And Jesus says, she's my daughter. Jarius, your daughter is sick. You have a very important request. You have an urgent message as a parent, and you would probably move heaven and hell for your child. Well, everyone is my child. Everywhere I look, I see my sons and daughters, and I have love and time for them all. Why trouble the teacher any further? It's too late. God can't save you now. And Jesus says, I've got time. Do not fear. Have faith. Believe. I have time for all my children. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now, is God going to answer all of your prayers the way you want? No. And to be honest, I don't even know why God answers some prayers and not others. You know, we ask God for the closest parking space, and then one opens up, and we say, Thank you, Jesus. Right? But if a mother asks for her son to be healed of sickness and then later dies, why does God give us parking spaces 
and not heal all sickness? I don't know. But here's the thing I do know. He has time for all those prayers. He listens. You are never bothering God. And ultimately, he wants to bring you rest. He wants you to live that abundant life. And so he, as your parent, is going to move heaven and hell to give you those things. Jesus says, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. Now, that love might not come about the way we want or in the exact way that we ask. That love might not come today or it may come tomorrow. It might come as a healing on earth. It might come as a healing in heaven. It might come as redemption. It may be in this life or the next. But do not fear. Believe. Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. What, what should I pray for? Okay, I'm, I mean, yes, obviously the big things, but, but what should I pray for? Everything. Everything. This says, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace. You have that confidence. If I were to take your hand right now and I was going to say, come and see, I would not take you to a man who would feel interrupted by you. Come and see a man who told me everything I ever did, right? And you pull away and you say, I, I, I don't want to bother the rabbi with my problems. I'm a sinner and I'm, I'm, I'm probably getting what I deserve. You know, it's too late for me. My time for restoration has passed. Friends, Easter is about restoration. It's about coming to see Jesus and being healed. It's about having all of our darkness driven from us and restoring us to our right mind. It's about cleaning up our mess. It's about becoming a whole person again. Easter is about our faith in Jesus and how the promises of the Bible strengthen us and help us face challenges. And most importantly, it is a reminder that it's never too late. God raises the dead. Second Corinthians says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. God is watching you. God's glory guides and protects you, and he heals you because there is protection and healing in his wings. You know, the demon-possessed man and the woman who was healed of unclean blood were both very lonely people, which makes today's talk all the more relevant, doesn't it? We have lockdown going on all around us. And when you look around, even here, who's missing? You, you, you maybe haven't seen them in a while. Maybe you haven't been seen in a while. I bet you could make a list. Have you reached out to the people that you haven't seen in a while? Have you called them? Have you emailed them? Who prays for the one who is chained to a rock on the outside of town? Right now we say, eh, one in four Americans suffer from loneliness. One in four. That's a quarter of America. A quarter of America say they have nobody to talk to or share their struggles with, or their pain, or their joy. And if you remove, let's say, family from that equation and you ask, okay, outside of family, who can you talk to? The number jumps to half. Half of Americans have nobody to talk to. This is why our church has a grief share. If you have lost someone, I would suggest you reach out to our church. You can call us or send us an email to ask about grief share and when it meets, we have a support group that gets together for people that need to talk about death and how death has affected them, how death immobilizes us so that we can't go out and live anymore. We have Stephen's ministry that if you're suffering through any depression, or any financial burden or uh, marital 
problems or uh, being a parent or being lonely, anything that you're struggling with, we have lay Stevens ministers on site who are willing to meet with you and talk to you and listen to you. And you can call the church or email us for an appointment. We want to do our part to make sure that there are people in this community who will listen to you, who will be your friend, who will take you by the hand and say, come and see Jesus. In fact, we've even started our men's ministry back up. We have our men's Bible study. Did you know that only 12% of American, friend, of American men say that they have someone to talk to? 12%. 51% of American men have two friends or less. And 43% of men have never told another friend that they love them. Nah, it's too late for me. No, God can heal you of your loneliness. There is healing in his wings. Jesus came to liberate, he came to restore, he came to heal, and he has time for you. He has time for his children. He is not bothered by you. James, the brother of Jesus says, is, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of the faith will save the one who is sick. And the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. How do you greet other people when you come to church? Say, how are you? And we say, fine, and you? Right, that's a normal greeting. But notice how in this passage, James begins with the understanding that church is not just a place for happy people. Listen, I know we told you that we were fine, but not everybody who comes through those doors is fine. Church is also a place for people who are sick. And the word sick there in the Greek can also mean tired, can mean exhausted. Anyone here, here tired and exhausted this morning? Does anyone need a power nap or two? Does anyone need to be left in bed just a few more hours? Does anyone need the school year to last just a few more weeks? Does anyone need a live-in maid who's going to come to your house and fold laundry? <laughs> Do the dishes. Vacuum. The Bible says, get some people around some other people. Be the church and surround those who need to be touched. Find those weary people. Find those sick people and anoint them. The word anoint just means bless. Just bless them. So my question this morning is, Jesus has time for us. Who do I have time for? Sure, some people aren't here this morning, but I'm sure they're fine. I called them three weeks ago. You know, I heard they're actually quitty, pretty quiet people. It's probably best to just leave them alone. Is that how you'd want the church to, to treat you? Jesus shows up to a town and says, Hello? Hello? Excuse me, you have a sick man out here and you've all abandoned him and you actually have him tied up like a dog? Jesus heals him and when the town shows up, they say, What did you do that for? We had this under control. We didn't ask for your help. Why don't you just take your curiosity and your help and go someplace else? We don't like Jesus coming in and cleaning up our mess. Maybe he's even showing us where we fall short. But we need that. We need that example, don't we? The example says, you know, it might make us uncomfortable, but we really should walk over and introduce ourselves to that gentleman who I've seen coming to church for weeks now. When I see that woman every week and she always sits alone, I really should ask her her name. We shouldn't assume that people enjoy being alone. Nobody comes to church to be alone. 
Jesus has time for me. Who do I have time for? Or maybe a different question is, what healing do I need? Don't suffer in quiet. Refuse to be lonely. Shout! This day will be different than it's been before. I know the other doctors have all given up hope, but I won't. Two people in this chapter refuse to say that their life is fine, and they reach out for help. Say to yourself, today is going to be different. And push through the crowds, elbow through those people. Reach out to the church for help. Reach out to Jesus and believe in the abundant life. Believe in love. Believe in rest. Believe in resurrection. Church should not be a place where we pretend everything is fine. People are bleeding. People around us, their lives are hemorrhaging. People are dying. Church doesn't have to be a place where we put on our best clothes and smile and sit still and go home. I mean, it can be that, but it doesn't have to be that. Church can also be a place where we say, God, I've tried everything. Heal me. Heal my life. Put me back together. Listen, if life isn't all that it could be, don't let the world around you tell you that it's fine. If your life could be better, don't settle. Jesus says in John 10.10, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus came to give more to everyone. Right? God wants to give you more. And he has time for you. So if you're scraping by, barely making it, limping through, hurt, tired, sick, lonely, push through the crowd, come and see. Let's pray. Precious Jesus, we are so in awe of your love and your ability to meet the needs of everyone around you. That even as a second person makes a request of you, you don't put her aside and say, well, actually, somebody else was first. You show that you have time for everyone. You have time for all needs, all prayer requests. Lord, help me to make my prayers longer, where I not only tell you everything that is on my heart, but that I also give you worship and praise for all the things you do. Lord, I want to spend more time in prayer. I want to spend more time talking to you. I want to spend more time telling you about my life and the dreams that I have, the things that I see and that I want to do. I want to tell you about all the ways that I feel that I don't measure up. I want to tell you about all the things that I want to accomplish. I want to ask you for strength. I want to ask you for hope. I want to ask you for courage. I want to ask you for forgiveness. Lord, we pray for those who are not here. Or I want to pray for those who I'm not with. Maybe it's me that's home. Maybe it's me that's alone. Maybe it's me that is pulled away from everyone else. Lord, I pray for those that I haven't seen in a while. I pray for those familiar faces. Lord, remind me, not this week, today, today. I need to do it today. I need to reach out and call those people that I'm thinking about. Maybe it's my family in another state. Maybe it's my friends from high school that I haven't seen in a while, but they've just been on my heart lately. Lord, who do I need to reach out to? Who do I know might be alone? I might be needing a friend. May I be the person that goes out there and checks on them, reminds them that they are loved and thought of and prayed for. Lord, you have time for me. I want to have time for those who need me. Thank you for every blessing. Lord, we pray again for the healing 
of this world. We pray for vaccines to be distributed quickly. We pray for this disease to go away. We pray that people come outside again, go back to church again, go back to school again, and that our nation is once again restored. I pray for healing. I pray for wholeness. I pray for peace. And we ask it all in your Son's name, who is the Prince of Peace. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for coming by and listening. Of course, this is out there on the internet. You could be listening to us on podcast as MP3, or you could be watching us on YouTube or video. Please don't forget that there's a link up there at the top. You can also clip and copy this and share it to your own social media wall, or you could share it to the wall of someone who is a friend of yours. Like this video so other people can find it faster. Subscribe to our channel, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.